Before we get started with the episode, Talk Music Talk has an app. It's free and it is for iPhone and Android. With the app, you get every single episode. That means you get the back catalog plus new shows automatically appearing in your feed. You can download shows for offline listening. You can star your favorite episodes. You can share episodes on social media or email them directly through the app. It is on iTunes, in the Google Play Store. It is free. Just search for Talk Music Talk. Once you download the app, please leave a rating and or review in the store to help spread the word. And maybe you're not an app person. You can still subscribe through iTunes or Google Play. All links are at TalkMusicTalk.com. And now for today's show. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Talk Music Talk with Boyce. I am Boyce and this is my podcast. Thank you for checking it out. Talk Music Talk is a weekly music interview podcast where I, Boyce, your podcasting host, has long form conversations with people who are connected to music from different genres, different backgrounds, and not just singers and songwriters, but also music therapists, music journalists, music photographers. And on this extra special episode, I present episode 100. That's right. The show has seen its 100th episode. I am very thrilled to share this with you. A few things about the podcast before I tell you about the guests. I started it back in November 2014 for several reasons. First being that I love music. It is a passion of mine or an obsession, which I am okay with. I also started it because I love podcasts and I love interviews. In particular, I love the long form conversation because I believe it really gives you a deeper insight into a person and also that it has the potential to make what they do resonate on a deeper level. In particular, with this podcast is music, and it's one of the reasons why I always feature music of a guest whenever possible so that there's even a connection or line to what they do that you get to hear that immediately, hopefully. I knew I would love doing the podcast from the beginning. Didn't know I would love it as much as I do. I've learned so much over these past two years and a few things that I have discovered in the guests that I've interviewed, some over overriding themes that how when you decide to choose a life in music it requires great courage and the thread from guest to guest has been that they have all overcome obstacles to realize their dream of music and that may mean they have the luxury of just doing their music full-time that's it they don't have to worry about anything else or it may mean they have to work five jobs just to record their latest album that is on Bandcamp. And you may argue, boys, that all dreams require courage, and I agree, but I'm going to say it's a little extra something in music because most people aren't told or encouraged to pursue a career in music or the creative, artistic life. And these people that I have interviewed, some were encouraged, probably a lot weren't, and have said as much, and you get to see the whole spectrum of music a music life. For me, music has been a lifelong passion. I not only make it as a singer and a songwriter, I listen to it always. I'm reading about it. I go to a lot of shows. I'm constantly thinking about it. And this podcast has been the opportunity for me to talk to dynamic, creative music people who are connected to music in some way, who feel the same way that I do, and they share their thoughts about music, their own and others, their lives, their influences, just whatever comes up in the course of an hour or so. And I have learned from all of them, whether it was to stay motivated or a different way to look at a life that I had not considered before, Or they may have just motivated me to read a great book. But I have learned so much from them. Now, that brings us to episode 100, which continues what I have learned. This episode is with Carlos Dangler. You may not know him by that name. You probably know him better as Carlos D. He was the bassist in Interpol. Left the band in 2010 
They were called post-punk revivalists, which is what he says in the interview and also on their wiki page. It is his first sit-down audio interview, first time that he is discussing publicly why he left the band in 2010. And just to put things into perspective of how successful they were in the time period, they were part of that whole wave of New York bands to break big. Their debut Turn on the Bright Lights came out in 2002, and just the year before, we had the debut from The Strokes, and then the year after, in 2003, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah's Fever to Tell, their debut. During his course with Interpol, his stint, Carlos released four studio albums, they went on three successful tours, and regarding the albums, you're going to hear his thoughts on all four, including that final album he did with them, where he just turned in his parts, and walked away. Now, what has he been doing in these past six years away from public life? He retreated from it, and he recovered from Interpol, and probably most importantly, he's been following his new passion, which is an acting career in theater, and he has recently, last year, he graduated from NYU's acting program. He received his MFA there. And just this August, he staged his first solo show. It is an hour-long monologue. It's called Homo Sapiens Interruptus. We talk about that. It premiered at the Fringe Festival in August for a slew of well-received shows. This is a very candid interview with Carlos You get to hear it all. You get to hear what it's like to be behind a successful band. His journey in the band, the highs, the lows, the band therapy, all of it. For fans, you finally will get to find out why he left. What happened with this situation? If you are a casual fan or maybe just unfamiliar with Interpol, that's okay. Because this is also a great story about courage, which I mentioned. Courage to step away from something successful, even when it no longer works for you. Even when, despite outward appearances, everything looks so wonderful and rosy. This is also about starting over, reinventing yourself, and also personal issues that he went through that he never discussed publicly about childhood trauma and overcoming addiction. And I think ultimately it's about someone, Carlos, in this situation, taking responsibility for his life without blame or accusation and deciding to make better choices. I I can't think of a better way to cap off the 100th episode than to have a conversation with him. We recorded this in July, just a week before the monologue shows opened up. Just to give you some perspective, here it is. Without further ado, my conversation with Carlos Dangler. Enjoy. So when I got here... You mentioned about, because I gave you a book of mine in different mediums, and sometimes you hear people say as an adult, I don't know what I'm going to do be when I'm a grown up, right? So when transitioning from one medium to another, was that a natural transition for you or did you have to fight it? Like, how did, how did that transitioning look like for you? Um, and I'm talking I, from music to acting, I guess. Sure, obviously. yeah. I mean, it's just, it's so complicated, but, um, I know, I don't think I, I don't think I, I, I had to fight it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it certainly didn't fit with the band. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, or at least what I was sort of needing from the theater mm-hmm. was a kind of energy that I don't feel was capable of being present within the structure of being in Interpol. Yeah. Um, so if there was any kind of fighting it, it was because I was just sort of trying to decide, you know, where, where did I actually want to go? But I feel that the actual, um, um, curiosity and, and sense of, um, adventure and, um, and um, passion that I have for art in general kind of fuels a natural tendency that I have to, mm-hmm. to make transitions. Okay. Um, and it wasn't in a way it's like, um, you know, it gets more painful as we, as, as we get older, but as a youth, I was, 
I mean, I was switching all mm-hmm. the time. Generally from like, for instance, music, I would shift from being one thing to another. Um, you know, when I, when I met the guys from, from Interpol, I was not pursuing a musical path because I'd already kind of wanted to be, um, a scholar, if you mm-hmm. will. Um, and, and so I had already kind of made that transition yeah. and then I transitioned back into music. <laughs> so now I that transitioned out of music. So it's like, it's just a pattern with me. Okay. Um, it just so happens that I believe that this transition is probably the, the best documented out of all of them because nobody knew who I was yeah. before the other ones. So how did it rear its head when you were in the band? The how did idea? it what? Rear its head when you were in the band. Like, were you thinking about acting? Were you like watching movies and like, oh, I'd like to do that? Or There, w- there was definitely a little bit of that. Um, there was like a respect for acting mm-hmm. that started to grow within me. Um, I... You know, I grew up not, uh, you know, my, my opinions were not, uh, in the, in the household that I grew up in, my opinions were not valued. Mm -hmm. Um, I did not grow up in a supportive environment. Um, I think I've attached some kind of like hardcore need to be heard, you know, on a vocal level. And, um, but I've had problems around like having confidence around it because I always feel like, I'm bad for that, Mm -hmm. you know, because my parents kind of said that. Um, and the band for me was kind of like the perfect way for me to express myself without having to kind of poke at that, um, taboo Mm -hmm. of like speaking, you know, I could be a silent, I could be a silent bass player and, and then just use my image and my attitude and my style and my talent for the, for the instrument and for the, for, you know, the keyboards and everything that I was doing in the band. Mm -hmm. Um, as, uh, you know, as a way to express myself. Um, and then it just, the desire to really, you know, uh, um, promote ideas that I have swimming around in my head, mm-hmm. ways that I view the world and, um, realities that I am interested in conveying, um, you know, through interviews, through, through being on stage, mm-hmm. it started to grow and, um, it started to really, really take hold um, as the band became successful and I, you get this feeling that you could do other things yeah. if you want to do, you know, you know, you get successful and it's like, Oh, okay, cool. Like what else can I do? You get mm-hmm. really excited. Um, and I got very excited by acting. So I started taking acting lessons at this rinky dinky, like, like not even, <laughs> not even a place. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I, I hesitate to, to, to name it because I don't want to publicly bash like a place uh, but it, it was where I started. So, I mean, you got to start somewhere, yeah, right? So yeah. there's a value to that too, but like, just um, getting started. You know, yeah, it's just, <laughs> yeah. I was just getting started and, and, and it, and it was fine. It was great. And I, that's where I discovered, uh, theater. Um, because up until then I was like, Oh, I just want to learn a little bit about acting, learn how to be on camera mm-hmm. and then just like, you know, be in a movie or something yeah. like that. I mean, I had that idea in my head because I'm already a famous guy in this band. <laughs> like, Hey, I'll just be in a movie, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I discovered the theater. Like we did a scene from True West in scene study class, mm-hmm. and that's when everything changed. For uh, okay, me. that's when I was just like, "Oh wait, I, I actually love this a little bit more than I thought I did." Okay, um, and, and uh, um, you know, at the up until then, I was like, "Oh well, I could never be a theater actor." Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's too. That's just too. You know, I wouldn't dare <laughs> try to be a theater actor, but the passion for it overtook me, me um, and um, that that really set me on a certain course, I think. Mm-hmm. So then does that mean that the band was sort of become like a restraint or constraining to you? You know, I, I want to say <laughs> no, but I'd be lying if I did, mm-hmm. because it, it's just like, you know, things weren't good. Yeah. They weren't, they just weren't good at the time. Mm -hmm. It's funny, you know, like you hear about this all a lot of the time with marriages. Um, you know, people leave other people and they immediately get married to other people. Yeah. And then, and then you wonder that person must have been there. (laughs) They just come out of the woodwork. (laughs) Yeah. That is the assumption. You know, they were, they were there before the divorce happened, Uh you know, and people do that. 
And I suspect there's a little bit of that happening with me, mm-hmm. um, where I kind of had discovered something else that was fulf- bringing me a kind of fulfillment that the band could never. And I was experiencing so much pain um, being in the band, mm-hmm. um, being in the music industry, um, that uh, I, I have to admit, I, as much as I don't want to admit it, that I, I couldn't help but to feel that the band was constraining mm-hmm a creative impulse that I had within yeah. me. And it wasn't for lack of actually um, trying to make it work. You know, I yeah. tried to, I, I was like, you know, it was three torturous years of trying to, but it's like somebody discovers, you know, I got sober, mm-hmm. you know, I discovered, okay, enough of this fucking rock star yeah, shit, yeah. you know? So like, like, who am I really? I want to try out things. I want to like investigate. I want to be curious about art. Mm-hmm. Finally, I'd woken up, I'd stopped doing all the drugs that I was doing and I'd stopped drinking all the drinks I was drinking. Yeah. And, uh, and of course I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. So it was a hot mess, you know, mm-hmm. but it's like, it's new energy that was being introduced into a formula that had already kind of experienced a level of success. And what happens when the business model, okay, you know, it, it's like that formula has to stick. Mm-hmm. And there I was, I was like, well, actually uh, the formula is not complete mm-hmm. yet because like now I'm really interested in acting and I've got to make that work, you know, and it, and it got very, very complicated. Yeah. So when do, what was the sign, like maybe like the first sign when you realized that the band wasn't working? Because there's usually like some kind of clue before it's full blown. It was weird, like during the recording of um, Our Love to Admire. Mm-hmm. I remember I, um, I wasn't, uh, Paul and I were not speaking. Yeah. And um, to record a record under those kinds of circumstances is extremely difficult. Um, and um, I was getting really frightened, actually, at the notion of going on tour. Since, you know, I, I had gone on, it had been two tours already. And um, I had done those tours under a certain, like, I, oh God, I'm actually going to use this word, mm-hmm. I guess. Okay. <laughs> do you know the word I'm talking about? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> You're a writer, of course you do. <laughs> to all the listeners who don't know what the word I guess is, it's spelled A E G I S, and please look it up and excuse the S A T word. <laughs> but I was, I went under those first two tours under a certain I guess, mm-hmm. and the I guess was thou shalt consume mm-hmm. and and obliterate thy surroundings at all costs. Okay. <laughs> it was like the Nikki six model of destruction. Uh-huh. You know, it was like rock star and that's what I'm doing. And then I sobered up. And so for the third record, it became all about like, no, I want us to be like Radiohead. You know, <laughs> like let's be like real artists. Now. This is sober. You yeah, sober. Okay. And so, you know, in, in practice or in, in, in your mind, all of this makes sense in practice. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite a different story. And, um, you know, so there were ruptures and, uh, you know, I started to feel really uh, like, uh, Oh, I don't know how I can go on this tour. Um, I don't feel like myself. I don't feel safe. I don't feel supported. Mm -hmm. Um, the band started to feel frightening to me. I realized I, I, I wasn't friends with, with these guys. Yeah. I've been so busy with me and my persona and who I wanted mm-hmm. to be and Carlos D and blah, blah, blah. Um, everything was different. And I wanted to, I wanted to pause. I wanted to like, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I announced to the guys when it was like towards the end of mm-hmm. our love to admire recording sessions. I said, guys, I, 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 I don't know if I can go on a, yeah. on a tour. Like, I, I mean, maybe can we, you know, talk about it or like, is there a break that we could mm-hmm. take? I, I can't exactly remember what the, what the words were. Um, now you have to understand Capitol records. Okay. We yeah. had just signed to them and you know, it's like they're fucking throwing the whole fucking mm-hmm. magazines at us and like the, 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 all the ammo, all the marketing, every, you know, it's just like everything is getting ready. It's like, when's the album going to get done? Cause we're going to start blah, blah, blah. It's, yeah. a, it's a huge, like uh marketing blitz and a huge like you know um promotion you know mm-hmm. t- just with any album it's like it's a campaign yeah it's a total campaign and you're coming off an album that did really really well too and so there's a lot of expectation there were a lot yeah. of expectations 
So the feeling that I got when I announced that was not good from my bandmates. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we sat around and we talked, but I could tell that there was like a very, there was like panic. Mm-hmm. And I could, and I didn't feel ready to address the panic. So I did go on that tour and then a whole shit ton of stuff happened. Yeah. That was really bad on that tour. Um, and in many ways, I feel like if I were a different person, mm-hmm. like with a, a different set of uh, communicative tools, which I did not have, um, I did not know who I was. Um, I did not know who Carlos Dengler was mm-hmm. as a person. I had absolutely zero clue about what his needs were and what his wants were. Um, if I had a better idea of that, if I had better parentage, if I had a better upbringing, if yeah. I had more of a sense of who I was and I was in that band, I think I would have been able to communicate what my needs were mm-hmm. during that time in a much, much more effective way. Um, but I just wasn't, I probably would have said like, we have to take a month break or like we, or like we need to enter counseling because we're not getting along yeah. and so on, you know, but I was so afraid of so many things. Like I was so spooked out by mm-hmm. all of it and I just didn't want to do it. Yeah. I just didn't want to do it. And then, you know, that actually ended up being repeated on the fourth record. Mm-hmm. That's when I actually, I was like, okay, well that, that's, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Again, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to go on that tour again. <laughs> so how do you even, was when was it enjoyable like prior to the recording of the first album of the first album yeah like was there enjoyment oh yeah at some point oh yeah no mm-hmm. i mean it was so exciting to be in in a band in new york in the late 90s and in the early aughts especially when you just started to get um a sense that people were really listening mm-hmm. you know this is like the birth of hipster culture you know, the, the idea yeah. of a hipster was just not an idea before this. Um, and when the strokes happened, it was just, you know, kind of like a, a road had become paved yeah. in a way. And so everyone was walking down that road, you know, I was like, mm-hmm. wow, this is a fucking great new road. Like, look at this <laughs> over here's the fucking Ramones and over here's television. It's like all these bands that we forgot yeah. about and like, and they're here now and there's all these bands that kind of sound like them, blah, 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 blah. And here, look, there's Interpol that like, yeah. it's kind of like Joy Division, but they're also a New York band. Like, holy fucking shit. There was this sense of excitement, mm-hmm. sense of, of promise. And to be in the middle of that was, um, I, I, it, you know, it was also concomitant with uh, Electro Clash as well. Okay. So clubbing was like a thing back then that mm-hmm. like is not, you know, this is pre Facebook and all of that. So like people were still flyering, but there were so many different, um, nights to go to where mm-hmm. the same people went to, but it was like a different bar all the time. Okay. And it was all like, and the eighties was like the retro eighties thing, like electro thing was like happening, like full force. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was exciting. It was totally exciting on like a nightlife level. And what I personally loved about being in Interpol during that time was that how, um, how, how seamlessly Interpol fit with mm-hmm. that whole thing. So what ended up happening for me was that the actual business of being in a band okay, then had to part. actually happen. And that's where I started to go, Oh wait, this is not what I want. Mm-hmm. So I would be the guy that was always late to the bus. I was the guy that was always complaining that we mm-hmm. weren't at home. I got homesick terribly. Yeah. Like I just didn't want to be on the road. I wanted to be in New York city where like everything was happening. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, yeah, being on the road and seeing people like welcoming you to the yeah. city, like your album has already sold like X amount of copies in this market and this so- show mm-hmm. has already sold out and everybody's like Carlos and everybody's like Daniel and everybody's like Paul and Interpol and blah, blah. Yeah, yeah of course, that's fucking exciting. <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, it's hard not to like be any kind of person and be uh, uh, given that kind of attention and mm-hmm. not somehow um, become absolutely seduced by it. Hmm. It, it's impossible. Yeah. The energy is too, it's too, um, overwhelming, mm-hmm. you know? And then, then of course there's the, and then of course the music, I mean, like to me, you know, I know the third record tends some, you know, it has some people and some people aren't yeah. such big fans of that. Um, 
I don't know whether we're going to talk about the fourth record, but, I, but you we, can ta- we can talk <laughs> about it. It has not been spoken of. I have my own <laughs> position on that that I have not I publicly curious. spoken about. And I, will I am absolutely curious. Give you I my- absolutely love the fourth album. Really? Yes. The sec- Antics in the fourth album Okay, so let's favorites. talk about this. Wait, Antics in the fourth? Fourth album. Those are my favorite. So I, th- I believe that Antics is actually the best Interpol mm-hmm. record. Um, I think that... Um, I think that the what people love about the first record is just how raw and visceral yeah. and how just kind of like I mean it's your classic first album yeah. from a band it's like it'll never be repeated again mm-hmm. like you don't know what the fuck you're doing you're just like on a <laughs> shoestring budget and you're just like ah this part needs to go down yeah. and it's like and it's very punk in that sense and it's like yeah th- th- there are some issues with the way that album sounds there's like um you know, a kind of pacing that it has that is, in my opinion, structurally a little mm-hmm. bit uh, um, um, problematic. But, but it, you know, there is an excitement. There's like a newness there. And so, of course, I completely understand why people would be like, Bright Lights, that's... What yeah. yeah. Antics, I think... You, so Bright Lights, like any band's first record, is really like a greatest hits of like the band's demo years. Mm-hmm. That's essentially yeah. what, what a first album should be. So, like, Interpol had already been together as a band for about five years up at, um, uh, cause we formed in, we f- officially formed in 98, f- met in 97. So we'd known each other for over five years. Yeah. And those, uh, PDA was this, the song that, the first song that was ever, that was the, Daniel and I, when I first met him, our very first, uh-huh. like, session together, we wrote PDA okay. like at Funkadelic Studios in 1997. Yeah. So like, and then that's the first single on the first record, right? So that song, had, and that was like the third recording of PDA. Mm-hmm. Like that. So it's like that 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 was like an old song by the time yeah. it got to, and 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 so were many others. So it's like, it really, what it was was the greatest hits. But Antics, Antics is like we created that album in a year and mm-hmm. there was like a whole thought process behind it and the production behind that record I find it to be absolutely flawless and I find the nar- the narrative aspect of mm-hmm. Antics to be absolutely compelling so whenever I hear somebody say that they're a fan of Antics I'm like great yeah. because I, I do have such a respect for that record like I, just as a record I think I, it is such a a powerful tight mm-hmm. short to the point kind of like classic kind of um post-punk record yeah. or alt rock or whatever you want to call it uh post-punk revival i think that's the technical term for interpol is a post-punk revival. <laughs> post-punk revival and then you know our love to admire was like an attempt to kind of expand the horizons and i in, in a way i considered it like a preamble to the fourth record mm-hmm. in the sense of like we're trying to to kind of get a become like a bigger band now um so like we don't yet know exactly how to do that so it's kind of it's a, but here it is you know yeah. and it's a placeholder the idea was that the fourth record would be kind of that okay. the the fruition of that effort okay so it'd be more transitional the um, third album yeah i would consider like for instance i would consider bright lights to be an, a transitional record mm-hmm. to antics okay. and then i would consider our love to admire to be a transitional record to the fourth album. Okay. But you don't feel like with the fourth album well, tell me that why, you meet, met that. Tell me why, why, why you like the fourth record. I want to hear this. Uh, probably the melodies. Like for me, the melodies are strong. Well, or near as strong as the second album is Antics. So, yeah, I'm like a melody guy. So vocal like melodies. At, yeah, uh, yeah, the vocal melodies. So, like, I feel like very hook driven. Like, I can tell you, what is it? Like, the first four songs and then, I don't know the titles. Wow. Track six. Mm-hmm. And seven was it lights barricades? Like those are two of my favorite Interpol mm-hmm. songs. And then the last. Oh yeah, song, lights. Yes. Yeah, lights and barricades. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's like antics, and then underneath antics. Would wow. Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for you, man. Because that album. Because <laughs> they got trashed or they got mixed reviews. No, no, I don't. I don't <laughs> Am I being generous? <laughs> I think you might be being generous. Yes. <laughs> so what was uh? Okay, so the sound of the Our Love is Here to Stay. Was that, were you the influence of admire. it? I love to admire. Who, whose album is there? Whose album is that? Well, that's an old classic. I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's someone else. Yeah. Our Love, yeah, that's like an old know. standard. Yeah. So was that you or part of your influence, the stretching out? Like you feeling I mean, restrained and wanting more? Yeah, well, I think what, it, so I think with the sobriety, I was discovering, um, Classical, I was rediscovering classical music, mm-hmm. um, you know, when I was 
um, in the in the nineties, I was I, I, when I stopped listening to rock and roll, I, I started listening to classical music exclusively, okay. and I was like, okay, I'm a scholar, I'm going to go to NYU uh-huh. and be a philosophy professor, and I'm only going to listen to Shostakovich <laughs> and fucking Beethoven and uh-huh. Mahler, and like that's going to be my life. And um, and then I then I rediscovered rock and roll, and like forgot about that because yeah. I was like, you can't fuck to that music, so I'm just going <laughs> to like, oh, you know can't be a rock star to like. Huh. And then when like I got off my rock star thing, I was like, no classical. What happened to classical music? Like, yeah. oh, I fucking I love classical music. So I was like listening to class all my old classical albums um, again, and um, it's then I was like, oh, I want, I want, I want to see how I, how we can throw this into the band. Okay, I was discovering um, all the software, which actually Sam turned me on to because he was already kind of like a gearhead and mm-hmm. like, was like into all of these like symphonic plugins and like all these different kinds of sounds. So I like totally picked up on that. I set up like a whole like project studio in my room and I spent tons of money on like symphonic sounds. And like, so Uh I got really big on the keyboards. And for me, I just wanted to phase the bass guitar out of it and bring in the keys. Like I wanted to like create Mm -hmm. sonic tapestries and so forth. So that, you know, that's, that was starting in our love to admire. And and the, and the goal for me, uh, with the fourth record, um, was to, to really like, you know, create like a kind of like, you know, I I think we were very conscious about this. Uh, we wanted it to be the, um, our kid a, okay. That was like kind of the goal. We mm-hmm. were using Kid A as kind of like the template in terms mm-hmm. of the fourth record. Okay, which I don't hear. Well, there's a reason why you don't hear <laughs> boys. <laughs> what what, what would that hear. be? <laughs> so you know, I think to me one of the greatest. It's just um, it makes me really sad. Um, it's because of the way that I left. You know, um, basically. Uh, you know, we were recording this record and relations between us had devolved to their worst level. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were in counseling and we were not getting along and we were just tired. You know, we were just so tired. And, um, I, you know, I, I was the guy that was like, I don't know if I want to be in, you know, uh, to mm-hmm. their credit, no, though, Sam, Paul and Daniel, th- they knew they wanted to be in the band. Mm-hmm. Like they knew they, they, there wasn't a, there were, they weren't undergoing some kind of existential crisis okay. about whether, you know, they needed to be an Interpol or not. I was the guy who was undergoing that existential mm-hmm. crisis. And I think that in a way, you know, really made things very difficult for me and for them, you know, in a, but in a way that made it kind of singled me out in a certain, okay. in a certain way. Now I'm not trying to ex- excuse any of the things that happened yeah. because some of the things that happened were not good, but, um, but, but I, I was the one who left because I was the one who was having an issue with just the very notion of whether I even wanted to be in a band in the music industry and so forth. But I knew that if I was going to be in the band and mm-hmm. in the music industry, that I did have certain go- artistic goals and certain aims. And and I had certain personal issues with, yeah. with Paul uh, mostly, but also with the other bandmates. Um, so uh, I was I was up against a lot. Like I, I was encountering my own personal demons. I was undergoing therapy. I was sober. Um, I was realizing who Carlos Dengler was was Mm -hmm. you know and is something that i had never even thought about before you know and here i was kind of waking up to this reality of who i am i'm still doing i mean i'm still in that recovery process you know and that's this has been six years since that and um um it was frightening, you know, because I was waking up to a Wikipedia page, mm-hmm. you know, of like this guy called Carlos D. And I was just like, who the fuck is okay. this fucking dude? It was like a dream. Like uh-huh. I'd wake up and I had like this bender that I'd been. I was like, I woke up and I was like, what the fuck did I do <laughs> last night? Except it was like five years and three albums and three tours <laughs> and a band and like drugs and like all yeah. this shit, you know? And I was like, what the fuck? fuck that has happened like i just had no i had no way of processing so i mean i was full-on freak out like survival mode 
And I really honestly was trying my best to make it work. But, um, you know, personal issues are personal issues. Mm -hmm. And the personal issues that were happening in this group, whether or not I wanted to stay in them or not, um, there was an ongoing personal issue between myself and Paul that, okay. that, that finds its origin virtually from the moment that we met. Okay. And that was a problem that went ignored because, you know, you, the band, you're young and mm. ah, whatever. This is just sends them to 23. I don't know what the fuck. Yeah. Like, yeah, I like you. No, I don't like you. I like you. I don't, I don't. You don't really think about this stuff mm-hmm. when you're in your twenties. Then fame takes over. Then things get big. Shit gets solidified. You can't, you get less freedom to do things because now you're a product mm-hmm. and egos get big yeah. and it gets worse. And then next thing you know, it's 2010, yeah. you know, and you're on your fourth record and you're not budging. And that's what was happening. And so it was a fucking clusterfuck. Mm-hmm. Now, at the same time, I'm doing this record, right? I'm like thinking into myself. Okay, I want this record to be really symphonic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've thought about this a lot, and I do feel that um, it was a bit pretentious and, and kind of um, unrealistic of me. I think I kind of, in a way, was very much in love with the idea of expanding the sonic palette of the band, mm-hmm. but I don't know that I was really looking into the practical aspects. The fact that there were three other guys in the room, that there was that this was a collaboration, I really was not thinking too much yeah. about those sorts of things. Nonetheless, I was so fucking into the music that we were recording. And by the time we got into the studio to, to finish those tracks, mm-hmm. shit got so bad between me and Paul and between me and kind of the other two guys yeah. as well, between me, Sam and Daniel, like so much trust had been broken. So much bad, um, juju mm-hmm. had happened that, um, um, I had to leave and I recorded all my keyboard parts and, and my bass parts and I handed them over to, um, um, the, um, the engineer mm-hmm. and, um, in a, in like a CD ROM. And I, uh, I then, um, went to our last therapy session and yeah. I said, this is it. I said, this is it guys. And, you know, we hugged and, and I left halfway through and I was going to, um, you know, the therapist was like, okay, good. Well, come back and let's, co- let's reconvene in two weeks to pro to just to process okay. this. And I called her and she didn't return my call. So I don't think that they were really interested in the reprocessing. <laughs> like, like, now nah, we're good. Yeah. They're like, we're good. You're gone. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's actually what yeah. it was, but the point is, is that there was a plan to like reconvene mm-hmm. to, to process and it never happened. Um, so, so that happened. I dove into like, st- I was at Stella Adler mm-hmm. learning to be just, be- you know, the beginning stages of acting and all of that. And, um, I was just pretending that, uh, Interpol never happened. Mm-hmm. I was just like, whatever, it just never happened. Yeah. I'm just going to start the fuck over. Who cares? I'm 35. Like I can do this, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like another fantasy yeah. in a way. Okay. <laughs> um, but we got to go back at some point Okay. to right. what? Okay, the sound of the album. Like, sure, why oh, I'm about to. Yeah. Oh, okay, we're getting there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, because I had left that CD ROM uh, with the engineer, right? Yeah, I wasn't with there for the parts. mixing. I wasn't there for uh-huh. anything. Okay, and and so one of my classmates at Stella Adler, like a year later, was like, "I have the new Interpol album. I don't know if you want uh-huh. to hear it." And I was like, "Okay." I so you hadn't even heard it. I'll Prior to it. it being released. Oh, no, dude. Okay. I just, I completely shut my ears. I like hibernate. I was like, I don't want to know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And, you know, I'd spent a year con- con- with talking with a lawyer about a separation agreement. Okay. You know I mean? Like it was bad. It was like, I was just, I was just going to acting school and like trying to get a separation agreement mm-hmm. signed between me and them. Like, and I didn't, uh, I didn't, um, I, I didn't want to listen to anything. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to like, I was just angry and I was like, fuck, fuck this. And I'm, 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 I'm just want to focus on my acting right now and blah, blah, blah. And when my classmate said, Oh, I have the new intro. Yeah. So she burned a copy for me. And when I heard that album, I was shocked. Mm-hmm. I was, I gotta say that I was totally, absolutely 100% shocked. And look, 
I left the band. So who am I to fuck yeah. to say anything, right? I mean, come on. I'm not mm-hmm. here to be like, oh, you fucking did this. <laughs> you did, we, we were supposed to make – and then you uh-huh. turned it into this. You know, I'm not here to like say that. Yeah. Like I fucking left the band. I, le- I, I, I rescinded any kind uh-huh. of like creative control uh-huh. over that. Th- so that being said, it was absolutely not the – the intent, and so I was I was fairly aghast by the by, mm-hmm. by the results of of the mixing of the vocals of you know none of those vocals that are on there or I think ninety nine percent of those mm-hmm. vocals were not what I think Paul if I if I'm if I if I can surmise correctly I don't know I haven't spoken to him in six years but if I had to guess I think I left and then he decided to just start from square one okay. because none of the vocals that we had worked on were there were were on that album. As far as I can recall, mm-hmm. you know, I remember listening to it and being like, oh, my God, like none of this is like what we worked on. And you know what? If I were in his shoes, mm-hmm. I'd probably do the same thing. You know, some yeah. guy quits a band and like blah, blah, blah. The point is, I do need to state for the record that for me, mm-hmm. that album is it, it breaks my heart. There's it was it's like this child that I had to let go of. That I could never claim, then I and I can never claim that child. Yeah. But I did raise it, it for the first two mm-hmm. years, so I do know what like it could have been, okay. or what if I would have stuck around for that mixing session. Like I, I just I always wonder what what that album yeah. could could have been like. But certainly, what it is in terms of what was released is was not not, the is not what I was you know kind of participating yeah. with. So was it a sonic problem issue or was it? songwriting like were you happy with the songs yeah see that's what i think i think if if one takes a re-listen to that record and just tries to like factor out the mixing because the mixing is really bad Mm -hmm. and the the um uh you know the 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 keyboards are completely submerged uh um you know that album uh i was i was barely playing any bass when Mm -hmm. we were uh rehearsing for that record it was like i was behind the keyboard console like working with a computer Mm -hmm. and like uh sam was going to a click so all the keyboard parts were just kind of like happening with with sam yeah um i think if you if you were to re if if the if the album were remixed brightened up Mm -hmm. um you know i'm not i can't i don't know what vocally would would happen in that case um i don't know that the vocals that are i only listened to the album once okay so you know it's I'm, I'm, so this I've, is just coming well, from I've one. listened to the album more than you. <laughs> oh, you you absolutely have listened to the album <laughs> more than I have. I've been listening to it since it came out. Right? Wow. I mean, you know, maybe it deserves a second listen. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it doesn't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, I, I, I don't know what kind of vocal treatment um, this, you know, uh, fantasy new mix yeah. of the fourth record would would require or what would be appropriate for that. But if you just take that out of the mix for a second and, and if we try to think about what what my intentions were behind the record mm-hmm. as I was working with them on it, um, you know, the keyboards would be much higher in the mix. There were lots of keyboard arrangements that were composed that didn't make it to okay. the mix. Um, there's a whole kind of like... Uh, I don't know. It's like an emphasis on there that was um, um, that's missing. I think. I think it's like, you know, maybe they needed to do it very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm sure that my departure probably created a lot of like chaos and yeah. you know just probably scrambling. So maybe they just didn't have a chance to really to to do it. I I, I don't personally know mm-hmm. what the actual circumstances behind the engineering of the record was, but I don't feel that that um, that it was mixed properly yeah. at all. What was your part in uh, songwriting in that process? I I was, um, what it was what what it, like what, was it a, like you it was what my, sitting my st- in a room together? So I mean, you know, um, you know, this was a constant like problem as well for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I just you know when I think back to the kind of person that um, that I was when I was in the band. Um, you know, there was a lot of stuff that I was fighting for that, um, that I thought like, I really, I just like, to me, it was like the most important thing in the world. And for me, the most important thing in the world was the, the songwriting dynamic between me and Daniel. Okay. Um, so you were like the core. Uh, that's how, that's how I wanted it. Okay. 
And I don't think that that's what the reality was, mm-hmm. actually. I think the reality was that there was someone else in the band that also wanted, okay. know, that was uncomfortable with that dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that, that was a huge issue in the band for like a long, you know, for the, mm-hmm. for the entire history of it. Okay. So, uh, you know, for a while we worked around it. And then I think when it came time to the fourth record, you know, we started the fourth record and I made a very, very firm announcement. Um, yeah, for this record, it's going to be Daniel and me because mm-hmm. I, I, I don't want to collaborate anymore on my, like, we'll get much more done. And I just, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, there was a begrudging, um, response to that. Yeah. And then it, you know, it just created more tension okay. and so forth. And, you know, when I think about that, I, I also think like, it's just, you know, I, I don't want, I'm not here to cast blame mm-hmm. and say like, Oh, because if that person didn't cooperate, then things yeah. would have worked out and I would have stayed or anything like that's, I, I ultimately, I don't think it was my fate to stay mm-hmm. in the band no matter what. Um, but, um, you know, so my role in that was that I, th- I don't think that I was, um, I think I was being very, um, um, just um, in, intransigent mm-hmm. about that. I was like, this is how it's going to happen. Yeah. And I'm sick of this and blah, and blah, blah, blah. And it, I was, it was somewhat of a tantrum. Mm-hmm. Um, but in my opinion, I feel like the, that was where the best work was coming from okay. is, is, is me and, and Daniel working together. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's how that fourth record kind of came. Okay. It was like a lot of keyboard parts written while Daniel was playing the, the guitar. Okay. And then Paul would do his own lyrics. Is that- exactly. Okay. Was he coming up with the vocal melodies, or was that you and Daniel? Oh no, Paul always wrote the vocal melodies. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is also fascinating. Right? You think so? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This okay. is this. Yeah. Uh, so my thing is, how do you even write songs when you're feeling all of that tension? And was the tension between <laughs> you and Paul? <laughs> Was that just one of those things you met and like sometimes you meet people and just the chemistry is just off? Like there's not like there's really nothing you could do to fix it. Like people would have to become someone else entirely. And like if you're starting from there, other than just treating each other with treating each other with respect, how could you possibly even fix that? If you're treating, if you, other than treating someone with respect, like how can you even fix like the chemistry is just oh, yeah. off? No, you like can't. The, yeah. Um. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. I think you're right, and um, I think it is really a really rare band that actually has. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what U2 is like. I don't mm-hmm. know what uh, the Chili Peppers are like as a band. In you know, I don't know what their internal family dynamic is. Yeah. I don't know who, like, the whistleblower is and mm-hmm. who is the father and who is, like, the forgotten child. Like, you know, every band has its, you know, everyone in it. It's a family. And therefore, the, it has a fa- And if it's a functional family, mm-hmm. everyone has a voice and everyone... And I imagine that with the with the with the legacy acts like Radiohead, like you yeah. could say, I'm sure they they strike me as a band that probably have worked out their personal kind of way of working mm-hmm. with each other really, really well. I have big time family issues. Yeah. I grew up in a f- awful, awful family mm-hmm. with f- lots of trauma, lots of abuse. I don't speak to my parents any longer. Okay. I don't even I don't even keep in touch with my family because um, of the recovery that I'm undergoing. Mm-hmm. It has required me to completely separate from the toxic ele- uh, dysfunctional elements, okay. just to protect uh, yourself, to protect, to protect the integrity of the self, which was denied as a as a child. Mm-hmm. Your only child, or something? No, I mean I might as well be an only child. I have mm-hmm. a brother, and um, he too. I mean, we were we were victimized. Mm-hmm. We were absolutely victimized, and um, you know. I say victimized. I think, you know, part of the struggle is to stop looking at yourself as a victim and start looking at yourself as a survivor. And that's what I am. I am a trauma survivor. But at the time, as it's happening, you are, you are a victim. Of course, your parents are, you know, it's a birthright that's denied you, Mm -hmm. you know, when your parents abuse you. So, um, and I think what we do as people, and I'm not alone. And this is a very common, and you, you, 
especially if you start to undergo this kind of therapy and this kind of recovery, you start to see, you start to see other people and how they've strategized mm-hmm. their kind of trauma that they grew up with. And what we, we do, it's what it's called, it's, tra- uh, it's traumatic reenactment is what it's called. Okay. And we, we just find the same family again. We just do. We're so good at this. You know, we're yeah. so good at just being like, I, God, I'm missing an abusive father. <laughs> there you are. There, there you, you are. are. Yeah. <laughs> and it is uncanny the extent to which Interpol became my second mm. abusive family. And I'm not trying to say like, oh, and I was another victim again. I yeah, was victimized yeah. again. I'm only saying that it was a. It was a, um, a nut, it was like a re, I had restaged my family mm-hmm. trauma. Yeah. And it's unconscious. And like, completely yeah, unconscious. Completely. Yeah. And, and that's what was going on, you know, and that was the kind of pain that I was, that I was dealing with, mm-hmm. you know, and I, you know, the, the privilege to have been in a band like that, yeah. that has had that kind of an impact coupled with what I know about what it was like to be in it and what what was going on internally for Carlos mm-hmm. Dengler, not Carlos D not like yeah. the persona or whatever, but the man, the person it's, it's been, um, you know, it's been a lot of like having to really, a lot of talking to God. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a lot of just like, wow, what, what is anything mm-hmm. actually? Um, so that being said, you know, I think, uh, you know, that was Interpol's situation mm-hmm. from my perspective, just from mine. I'm yeah. not trying to ascribe any, but you know, they, they can have their perspectives and the, I don't know what Interpol is like now as a band, mm-hmm. as a threesome or, or, you know, however they are functioning. Like, um, you know, I am extremely happy for them that they are still together yeah. and that they're still doing, doing the music and still like going out there. I know what it's like to be out on the road and to actually have to mm-hmm. show up for all of these events and it is not fucking easy. Yeah. And so I have nothing but total respect for the, for, for what they do. I have nothing but total respect for them as musicians, as people. I'm not here to say like what they, you know, what, what, that this was the Interpol reality. Yeah. This was mine. It was my reality. Yeah. And yes, the chemistry issue was, was a, was a fucking problem. <laughs> it was a fucking problem. It's like, you know, when you're like in your family and you've got yeah. a cousin and you're just like, I am never going to fucking get along with yeah. you ever. Am I? And you show up for Thanksgiving and you're just like, wow. Okay. Let's just, we got to sit through this yeah. now, <laughs> you know, and except you're on tour with this person yeah. and you're on, you know, and it's something like animals is subbed at. Like you'll see two dogs and they're like, yeah. oh yeah, there's something about you. I don't know. And trust that with humans, you always like want to question that. Like, well, why is it like that? We, we should rise above that. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, no, you don't need sometimes to like, you can't. sometimes you can't, not everybody, yeah. like God did not intend for every single person <laughs> to get along with every other person <laughs> on the planet. Like God didn't intend that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what was the therapy? What was that called again that you... That I am undergoing yeah, or yeah, that the... the reenactment? Band, well, well, the traumatic reenactment is a symptom of, of, okay. of, of PTSD. Okay. But the tra- it's trauma therapy. Okay. And how did you get out of the your family? Like, when did you leave? Um, like, well, going to school? Like, how did you get away oh, from that? that no, that, that has actually been fairly recent. Mm-hmm. Okay, because I saw your post on Facebook about your father. Yeah, yeah. So that's like, for instance, that post was, um, you know, I had to think long and hard about. I think here's the thing, like, you know, you go, some people, and everyone chooses their own way to Mm -hmm. do this. So like, you know, uh, some people say, I got to keep this private and no one's going to know. And that's fine. Um, The thing with me is like, I think trauma functions very much on a collusionary level. Like mm-hmm. the collusion is, is a huge element of trauma, which is the secrecy. Like thou shalt not say what happens in the house. And so then you live with this mentality for the rest of your life yeah. thinking like, no, I'm not, al- I'm actually not allowed to talk about this. So in the sep- in separating myself from these toxic elements, I've actually felt, and I made a decision. And I think I made that decision that father's day that I was like, no, it actually is, necessary for me to be public about this because it's a way at least for me to defy the collusionary aspect mm-hmm. which keeps me inside the traumatic reenactment yeah. and the shame and the shame secrecy. and the, the secrecy and the awful awful um 
torture and pain of it. Oh, yeah. Did anyone know what was going on with you? As a I kid? didn't know what was going on with me, so no one else knew. Okay. I mean, my parents. Could, like, did you tell people? Like, you. I had no clue mm-hmm. about the kind of shit that I went through okay. in my childhood while I was with, while I was in Interpol. Okay. Like, I had absolutely no idea. Like, as far as I was concerned, everything was fine. Like, look, mm-hmm. I'm successful now, so like, my, everything must be perfect, right? Yeah. You know, I mean that that's another part of the lie. Okay. You know, but like the trauma as it was going on. Were you while con- I was a child. Yeah. Were you I, confiding in anybody? Nope. Or Okay. No, no, I was completely, completely alone. Mm-hmm. So, you have a relationship with your brother? I don't have a relationship okay. with my brother. Okay. No, do they reach out to you? Or? They do not. Okay. And how long has this been since you've not? Um, you know, parents. I've had a complicated relationship with my brother for, for years. Um, and I think, you know, to me, um, um, I have, I have, you know, I have such great sadness about mm-hmm. that, you know, um, and, um, you know, I'm undergoing a process of, of, uh, you know, of coming to terms with, you know, you know, there's a whole amends process. There's, mm-hmm. a, whole, there's a lot, there's, there, there's a, you know, when you're an older brother too, it's, okay. you know, there, it doesn't, it goes one way. It's not the other mm-hmm. way, you know. So you're the older brother? Or yeah, I have no business like being resentful mm-hmm. about anything that he's done. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's, that's the older brother yeah. problem, you know, um, and that is what's one, the age difference two and a half years okay um but uh you know it's another symptom of the the trauma i think you know where like um you know somebody that you grow up with is you can't even be friends with them because mm-hmm. you know what you went through together okay was so awful that um and you know it's sad it, there's so much sadness there you know but um but there's also so much hope you know mm-hmm. i have a lot of hope because i'm re- i'm bringing all of this into consciousness for myself okay you know, um, I have a lot of hope about being friends with Interpol again and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, I don't know, like, yeah. I don't, I have no idea like what that would look like yeah. or like, you know, how well it would be received or, or I have no, I, all I know is that, um, that I have my own stuff to unpack, yeah. you know, truths that I once thought were like made me look valiant like oh well i will like defy this mm-hmm. reality and, and it's like in the intervening years i have realized that actually the situation is a little bit more complicated yeah. than that and and i think going public like how you said about that post i think mm-hmm. what's important you know i'm also writing a memoir and, and all mm-hmm. of that sort of stuff and and um i think what's important in coming out is like people don't realize you know, what it's like to be in a band. And I think that, like, I don't know, I haven't read many rock memoirs, mm-hmm. but I, I just, I what I long for is a kind of memoir or a kind of accounting of, like, just how, um, how intense the process of being in a successful band is on a personal level. Yeah. Like, what kind, and, you know, some kind of monster kind of, like, Mm-hmm. But does a little bit. I don't know if you've seen. I'm sure yeah, you've I seen it. Right? Pieces. Yeah, so it's like it, it. It does kind of like hint. At, it doesn't do it all the way, but it does hint at a lot of those. It, it was very. In fact, when we entered uh, counseling, yeah. we were telling the counselors that we were interviewing, like, please watch some kind of monster because <laughs> this is what we want to happen uh, to us. Because <laughs> I don't think people either. Even the, they, even seeing that movie, that there is almost an envy of your life. So that's not deal with that whatever interpersonal stuff deal with it because you're famous and have you seen the amy documentary no no that that documentary is 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 so powerful oh the amy winehouse yeah 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 i did yeah oh you did see it yeah yeah oh okay yeah that's very it's like you kept rooting like okay this is gonna end differently even though you know it's not you know i think one of the most telling aspects one there's a moment in there where um <clears throat> um, there's like a, I think, I don't know if it's, the, it's not the Grammys. It's some, it's some award that's being, um, presented. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's not there to, to receive her award and the, uh, presenter cracks a joke, Yeah, which, you know, for the longest time she was the butt of the jokes mm-hmm. blah, blah, and you, and Dave Grohl is actually in the back in the shot. He's in the background and he chuckles along with the joke. Yeah. 
And it made me think like, I, I was like, oh, and I was chuckling too mm-hmm. when, when those jokes were being made, you know, I was also participating in that, um, bashing of Amy Winehouse yeah. and then she died. And it's like, you watch, you watch this documentary and you kind of say like, wow, somehow I was complicit in her mm-hmm. destruction. Yeah. Like, how did that happen? And it makes me angry. It makes me so fucking angry. The, the, when you see the people that handled her, her father, mm-hmm. like all these people who don't give a shit about the person, Amy Winehouse, yeah. and they only fucking care about the product. Yeah. And this was a sensitive woman who had no business like screaming at 20,000 fans. Mm-hmm. Like she was a jazz singer. She needed to be in clubs and just yeah. like, you know, and for whatever reason, her voice was so immaculate that it caught like fire and she was not prepared mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. And then she became yeah. the butt of, of everyone's jokes. And she's just trying to deal with the situation and she's got nobody that's supporting her. Mm-hmm. And then meanwhile, the entire public is making fun of her at the whole time. There is nobody listening to this person who is crying out. And then she dies. And it makes me fucking angry because I could have died. I could have died so many fucking Mm -hmm. times. It got in that bad for you? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it really did. You know, there were so many nights where it was like, oh, my God, like, I think I could die right now, Mm -hmm. you know. You wanted to? I don't know if I would say that I wanted to, but... um, The path that I was on was so extreme that, um, that I felt it could, I, it, I don't know. I just try to mention like maybe I could have met somebody mm-hmm. and maybe fallen in love in, with a certain kind of person and then gone in this or who knows what event might have okay. like led me into like a certain community in some city maybe. And I would have hung out there and maybe started doing heroin. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know what, like it was I got so saved. Okay. I got saved is what it was. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I am fucking lucky to be alive because of like the intensity of that lifestyle. So mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think, you know, people, I think you're right. I think people, you know, have very little sympathy for people who are successful. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just like, what the fuck do I need to listen to you for? Yeah. Mr. Moneybag success, yeah. fame and fortune. And I don't think that people really realize the whole story behind it. And I don't think that they understand what, what's actually going on on like a microscopic level, like psychologically, mm-hmm. sociologically. That Amy Winehouse story is like a combo of like trauma, psychology and yeah. sociology all conspiring together with capitalism to, to essentially amount to yet another entry into the 27 Club. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that yet another one. Look it up on Wikipedia on mm-hmm. Wikipedia, and see the fucking long list on the 27 yeah. Club. And that's not even counting the people that aren't in the 27 Club that have also died for, <laughs> yeah. for, numer- for, for very, very similar reasons. You know, it's a fucking dangerous lifestyle. And it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous um, undertaking mm-hmm. for certain people. Like, I know from from the people that I was in a band with, like, you know, there were certain dangerous moments for some of them, but for some others, like they never got it kind of got dangerous. Yeah. There's a way that you can just be in that lifestyle and not be in danger. If you yourself have a certain kind of psychological makeup, yeah. a certain kind of character, certain needs, whatever you're mellower. But, but if you are like me or mm-hmm. like, and like a host of others that go, go in yeah. that are artistic and creative and go into this sort of thing, who, you know, like Anthony Kiedis is a great, you know, his memoir, it's a fucking mm-hmm. great example of that sort of thing. And it's always so fantastic when you do read about the people that kind of face that and then they just make it out. Did people know what you were going through? No. Like how deep it was? Okay. Were you, what do you get like really good at hiding it? You become an expert. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I didn't, I was hiding it for myself mm-hmm. as well. That third tour was... The wor- there was one time where I thought I was going insane. I w- Basically, I was hiding in my hotel room all the time. Mm-hmm. And I was just working on my computer, on music, and overworking the shit out of myself. Um, working on a movie that was just awful. Yeah. <laughs> like, the movie is just... <laughs> I, I, I love that I did that movie, but mm-hmm. the movie itself is just, you know, but it was like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I just needed to work on something. 
that was not the, and I was overworking the shit out of myself. And, um, it was in Australia and I was in my hotel room and I really thought I, you know, we had to play a show and I, I really thought I was, I was going to, I was going to lose it. Mm -hmm. Like I thought I was going to have a psychotic break. And, um, you know, I opened the, uh, like there was like a sort of like French door window style kind of porch, like a tiny little terrace kind yeah. of opening in the hotel room. And I opened it out into the street and the brisk, fresh air kind of came in and I saw all these birds like flying from treetop to treetop, mm-hmm. like flocking together and singing together. And I was just like, oh my God, there's okay. Life is happening. You know, it just kind of did something to me. Like I was like, okay, I'm alive. Uh, I'm okay. Yeah. You know, it was like, it was an, in, it was a kind of like a divine intervention in a way. Um, but I, you know, that was like, for instance, that's one example of how I, I was saved. Mm-hmm. You know, there were, there were numerous other times that I was saved as yeah. well, but I was, you know, during that tour, it, you know, towards the end of it, I'm not very proud of this, but I was also requesting my own dressing room because mm-hmm. I just didn't want to talk to anybody. Okay. Who was, was your, was what was your drug of choice? Well, d- on the third tour, I, mm-hmm. I had stopped all drugs. Okay, you stopped it. Okay. I, I mean, I was like an occasional drinker, but like mm-hmm. even that, you know, so like, you know, but for, you know, during the Carlos D. Rockstar yeah. years, oh, it was cocaine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So how did you get sober? Like, what was, define that moment? Like, how did that happen? Um, I mean, that one is... uh you know, um, I got my heart broken. Mm -hmm. I broke somebody's heart and then they broke my heart. Okay. And I think this kind of like, um, it like destroyed the God construct that Mm -hmm. I had around myself, like that I was God and like, I could do whatever the fuck I wanted. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden that came crashing down. Yeah. And so I got really scared. I was like, Oh, I can't be Carlos D anymore. And, um, and I turned everything, that's when I like rediscovered classical music. I stopped going to like the dive bars that I was going to like stopped hanging out with all those people who were still doing blow and Mm -hmm. like, it just, I guess, and then I retreat and I retreated. I really like really totally retreated into kind of like a a cocoon in a way. Mm. Was it hard for you to get sober? No, but it was hard for me uh, because I didn't enter recovery immediately Mm -hmm. and I didn't go to rehab. I didn't have the tools to deal with the lifestyle with, with the business of being in a band and being sober at the same time. And when I, and when I left the band, that was when it was clear that I Mm -hmm. needed to, to do something about my thinking. Okay. It wasn't, it was no longer the, the actual behaviors themselves. It was like, it was my thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know I want to say about your post on Father's Day, because we talked about it as if people have already read it. So basically, it just told us that you don't have a relationship with your father, and you wrote that on Facebook. Mm-hmm. So that's the gist? That'd be the gist of it? Oh, yeah, that is the gist of okay, it. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. gist of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know we re- I referenced it without actually saying Sure, sure, sure. Okay, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure people will... Google. Like, like post on Father's Day and they'll go to my <laughs> Facebook page and just post. No, oh, here's this post. Yes. So what was the time frame? Okay, so you leave Interpol and then from being going to NYU for acting. From being accepted to NYU? Yeah. Like what uh, was the... So that's like, I left in January of 2010 mm-hmm. and then I got accepted to NYU at, uh, in, um, uh, I guess I want to say like March or April okay. 2012. Okay. But you had applied, I guess, like some time before. Yeah. I went in, I, I auditioned twice in a row. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So where were you, what was your intention of going into school? To get the be- best possible theater training that a mm-hmm. person could get. And to just start from scratch. Yeah. And to learn how to be an actor mm-hmm. without my persona. And was it hard for you to give up? Yes. And it still is hard to give mm-hmm. up. It's, it's, it, it, it goes, it, you know, fame, the cameras, the, mm-hmm. the whole experience and, and everything that people thought that, you know, even when, like when people today say Carlos, you know, it's just, I'm just like, I don't know who you're talking yeah. about actually. Like, like I, I had so, com- it's like, 
people, you know who people like, you know who fascinates me is people like Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. He's, he's got to have (laughs) figured out a way to be whatever his name, his real name is. I don't think it's a very pretty name from what I recall. Vincent. Yeah. It's Vincent. Ferner. Ferner. That's right. It's something like that. Why do I know that? (laughs) Yeah. Why do you know that? I have no idea. It's like Vincent Ferner. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Is it? And it's just like, how does Vincent Ferner Uh like, you know, like deal with Alice Cooper? He's got to, he's either gone Kanye West style and bought into his Mm -hmm. own like persona about it, but there's something about him that makes me feel like, no, he hasn't done that. Like he's kind of made a deal somewhere and he's been like, I know that I'm Vincent Mm Ferner and I'm just going to keep playing this role because it makes money and I have fun doing it. And I, and, and there's just some kind of exchange that he's Mm -hmm. made that it, and it works for him as a person as Vincent Ferner. You know, and he's fine being Vincent Ferner with one or two people or yeah. whatever, you know, like, and the rest of the world can know him as Alice Cooper yeah. and he's totally fine. Like, he's like, yeah, all right, well, that's what, but I know that I'm Vincent Ferner. Mm-hmm. See, I didn't have that. Okay. You know, I, I bought into, I became that. And mm-hmm. so when that, when you actually take that on, like your brain just, and to then undergo the process of letting go, I am still still like this interview is part of the process of me mm-hmm. just shedding the old you know shedding that old persona and you know then you then you do things and you you think like you're you're and you're like taking on this new persona so uh-huh. like i've been like now i'm a theater actor and that's my persona <laughs> now you know and i'm like oh no there i go again yeah. you know so it's like it's it's a long road to sanity mm-hmm. it's a long road to finding out who the fuck you really are the point of going to school, besides just getting damn fucking good theater yeah. ed, um, education, was also deconstructing that that part of me. Like, the theater community does not – most people don't know who Interpol is. Mm-hmm. Nobody gives a fuck. I got in there. Nobody gave a shit. Yeah. I was just another classmate. The teachers were like, Interpol who? Carlos D. who? I don't know who that is. Hi, mm-hmm. Carlos Dengler. I, we're here to educate you. Yeah. And that was really, really, really important to me is to start from the ground up that way. And, and I, I have this preconceived notion of, oh, there's Carlos D. Like, what's he doing here? Yeah, there was none of that. Yeah. I could actually hide. I could actually. So now, you know, lately my challenge has been like, oh, okay, now I have to come out again. Mm-hmm. And as in the moment that I raise my head, it's going to be like, oh, look, it's Carlos D. And I'm like, whoa, whoa wait a second. <laughs> I, I've been training as an actor for like three years uh-huh. and I, now I'm Carlos Dengler. I'm yeah. this Carl, I'm this real human being right now. And everybody's, you know, it's like, oh, it's, let's catch up. And uh-huh. you know, there's manipulation there too. Yeah. Right. There's like me trying to tell you, oh, don't mm-hmm. talk to me that way because now I'm this guy. And I, like, how is that any different than Carlos D? Yeah. You know, it's a trap in a way. So that's why I envy people like Alice Cooper who have found a way mm-hmm. to really like it's a costume for him. Yeah, yeah, and he has he probably has a consummate manner of putting it on and off. Mm-hmm. He probably knows how to do that really 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 well, you know. And um I'm still learning how to do that. Yeah. So what did you learn? Okay, you learned how to be a great actor or a better actor or a good actor. I like to call myself a decent actor. A decent actor. So you learn to be, how is that achieved? Like, what are some ways that they achieve that? I mean, (laughs) dude, it was like three years of Mm -hmm. boot camp, you know, Monday through Saturday, nonstop. I mean, some, some of us slept overnight Mm -hmm. once in a while, you know, because like it would get so late and it just wouldn't make sense to come back at nine in the morning to like go over your Alexander technique, Yeah, you know, at nine 30 in the morning when you've been rehearsing up until 10 30. Um, there's so much, I mean, mm-hmm. it's just, it's so much, I, I mean, I, there's not even enough time yeah. in the day to like really, um, go in it, but it, it is a full top down examination of yourself as a, as a, as a, as a homo sapiens, like mm-hmm. as like a creature, as a thinking creature. And it's like, you know, my body right now is very dip. you know, it's very different. Like I look at pictures of myself, like mm-hmm. as Carlos D and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh man. Like the chakra all off uh, here and like the posture and like singing this shoulder, you know, it's like, I've become this kind of like yeah. critic of like, <laughs> of like posture because I've learned so much in, uh-huh. in, 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 acting school, but it's, you know, 
I do yoga now. You know, I've, I've, I've gotten my body in tune. You know, it mm-hmm. was not in tune before at all. Um, and now I'm, my body is, is, is in tune for the most part. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, um, you know, I'm very grateful for that, for that, um, awareness, for that, like kind of physical yeah. awareness that acting, you know, actor training can give you with all the movement and all the, you know, and then of course there's the vocal instrument that they get you to, um, you know, access. You mm-hmm. know, there were certain habits that I had, uh, you know, I re- I'll never forget, uh, in singing class, I had a huge, uh, um, um, breakout moment or like a breakthrough, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, which my, none of my classmates will ever let me forget about it. But it was this, uh, uh, uh track from, uh, this song from, uh, it was, um, oh my God, Judd's song from Oklahoma, mm-hmm. the musical, um, alone. What's it called? Uh, I'm so bad with musicals and like, I've learned actually uh-huh. a lot about musicals by being <laughs> in, in, in acting school, but, uh, um, alone in my room. I think that's the, here I am alone in my room. I can't remember what the mm-hmm. lyrics were. Um, my teacher was always like, Carlos, you, you're not opening your mouth. You're, you're just not, I don't, I, I can't, I cannot. And I, you know, and there I am trying to sing mm-hmm. this song with my jaw, just kind of <laughs> halfway open. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm look, my mouth is open yeah. right now, you know? And she just kept like, go, she kept, no, you know, stop. Carlos, you are not. I just want you to okay. Mm -hmm. Forget the lyrics and just belt out the song. Just go ah, and I want to see that mouth open. Whatever you can do Mm -hmm. to. And I just you know then the pianist started again and I was just going ah blah blah, and my mouth was opening Uh and my and I tears were streaming down my cheeks and my classmates were like looking at me like holy fucking shit. Uh You know it's like this spiritual moment you know where like you're something there's a fissure in your like psyche or your like your mm-hmm. body like opens up in a certain way um and after it was over it was like it really was a portal yeah you like know, you had shed something shed some some yeah. trauma had been shed some kind of level of protection around my body around mm-hmm. my my thoughts had been because like why do why do people close their mouth you know they, we close our mouth because we don't want anyone to see what's going on inside mm. you know but if we actually allow ourselves to open our mouths so that you can see, you know, I'm letting something go here. I'm letting yeah. you have something that's inside of me. How can you act on stage if you're not ready to l- let, let a go. bunch of fucking people have that? That's kind of like the actual psychotic part about being yeah. an actor. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I am here to give parts of my soul away to a, uh-huh. a bunch of fucking strangers. <laughs> you know? Which I'm guessing you need it after the whole band experience. I think you might be right. <laughs> so you weren't even doing music at that point, like your own music. I have not done anything musically for, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I play on my piano. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, we did some music stuff while we were in school, but I, yeah. I actually haven't. Um, was that a burned out thing or just the time constraint? Of, oh, it was of total school. time constraint. Um, yeah, I was, you know, there was just no time. Mm-hmm. I've had no attention. And, and then since graduating, I've been trying to like, uh, you know, you know, I've been working on my fringe show mm-hmm. and I'm like just trying to, you know, establish myself as an actor mm-hmm. and stuff. So I, I have, you know, what, what's starting to happen is I'm thinking so much about music that I'm like, ah, I really should just go and do something yeah. musically. And honestly, like no one needs to know about it. Mm-hmm. It's like what we were talking about before that 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 thing that you were, that you mentioned about that um, collaborate or like where people go yeah to like play and not be known okay yeah so far yeah like things like that attract me where I'm just like I I just need to play music but I don't want it to be a thing mm-hmm. you know I mean I do have that idea about the Dead Can Dance revival like the yeah. Brendan Perry uh, I would call it the Brendan Perry um um tribute band okay so like that idea kind of like okay. tickles my interest or dangler can dance dude i can't <laughs> believe that you thought that like i actually thought of it more as dead can dangler oh did <laughs> so like if i were to like I like that too if dude, i were to dude, actually dude, dude. put it out uh-huh. you know if i were to form a band and i would like be i would do the brendan perry parts i would yeah. call the band dead, dead can, can dangler, dangler. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I say go with that. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, sure. So let's talk about your one man show. Let's talk about yeah, it. Yeah, let's talk about it, dude. How did the how did it come about? The inspiration, oh, the writing it. You know, it's it's just uh, it's been uh, it's just been something for two years. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been it's been something that I've been working on. It's been a monologue that I've been working on for two years. Um, was yeah. it your dissertation, or is it like a dissertation? No, or no, it, it was just like a. It's just they give you an opportunity to, in school to do stuff and, mm-hmm. and and you know just come up with whatever you can. I was just like, oh well, I was in this band, so why don't I fucking talk about that? Yeah. I think people want to hear about that. Let's just make it a theater piece. Mm-hmm. And dude, it's actually really fucking hard to like write a monologue uh-huh. that's like dramatic, that has dramatic weight, and like actually makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's not just a guy standing up and talking about his life, like yeah. to hold an audience. Like it is, and so it's an hour long monologue where I, and I stay seated at a, at a desk. I saw Mike Daisy do um, the agony and ecstasy of Steve Jobs at the public theater and it blew me the fuck mm-hmm. away. And then I started and then I discovered Spalding Gray and I just, you know, he had passed before I'd gotten a chance yeah. to see any of his work. But then, you know, on YouTube, you can see a lot of the stuff that he just done. And, um, you know, so I saw swimming to Cambodia and um, there's something about that aesthetic or that medium that just absolutely fascinates me that you could just sit at a desk and hold an audience mm-hmm. captive for that long and just talk about stuff in a way that is captivating, intriguing, that draws you in. There's just something so compelling about yeah. the sheer minimalism of that, but that it like, so I just saw Mike Daisy again at Joe's pub who he has a new monologue called the Trump card. Mm-hmm. And it was an hour and a half and it was fucking brilliant. Yeah. And it's just him sitting at a desk talking and it's amazing. And it's, it's just like the most riveting. It's one of the most riveting mm-hmm. pieces of theater I've seen in a long time. Yeah. So I'm I'm totally fascinated by that aesthetic, and so that's the aesthetic that I've chosen to tell my story. Okay. And um, you know, along the way, I found that you know I've gotten I've had this like pet scientific interest with paleo paleoanthropology, mm-hmm. uh, the science of human origins. And there's something about like the discovery of fossils. Like recently, there was uh-huh. Homo naledi, like this new discovery in South Africa, and, okay. um, and just like pa- tracing like the pattern of discoveries since you know trying to trying to create a line to to chimpanzees essentially Mm -hmm. is what we're doing like that seven million year gap like what the fuck was going on during that that just i mean that really like goes inside my brain in Mm -hmm. like a way that just like the shit that i just imagine when i think about that stuff so i was like oh let me put that into the piece somehow just give it a mythological backdrop Mm -hmm. so i kind of throw throw that in when i when you know when i find it poetically kind of um viable and then also i think what i really really wanted to concentrate with this piece was like what heavy metal meant to, to me okay like, sort of you know speaking about the trauma it was like the 15 year old inside of me that yeah. like didn't get the love that that he deserved you know heavy metal was the answer and like i wanted to write a play about okay. that and interpol has to do with that like mm-hmm. the guy that i was i was essentially reincarnating like the lost values of my old my, of my suppressed 15 year old yeah. when 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 interpol took off it was very much like a heavy metal rock star mm-hmm. like decadent spirit that that i was kind of on it just got corrupted with the drugs and the sex yeah. but but like it was coming from that energy of rebellion and anti-authoritarianism mm-hmm. And so um, that's kind of what the piece is about. Okay. Is like how, the the the, uh, the, um, the discovery of heavy metal, uh, how it how I became attached to it, how I sold it out when I was like I'm not doing music anymore, mm-hmm. and then how it kind of re- got rekindled when Interpol took over, yeah. um, and you know, and then um, and then somehow finding a way to put paleoanthropology in there. Mm-hmm. And it's about an hour long. Okay, who are your heavy metal? Guys, I had a metal period too. too. You had a what? I had you a had metal a metal period? period? Yes, I'm guys. still on my metal period. I, I used to love. I told a story to someone on another sh- episode about uh, my grandmother was really open to all kinds of music, and but she could not get with my metal period. And she was like, you know, I don't care what you listen to, but that devil music, I cannot. Because <laughs> I was listening to Black Sabbath, Ozzy, uh, Motley's uh, "Shout at the Devil." Yeah, that was my metal. Like, so who was yours? Similar. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the albums that I grew up with that really, really were close to my heart were um, Injustice for All by Metallica, okay. Peace Sells, But Who's Buying by Megadeth. The first four Black Sabbath records. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, the first Danzig record, Appetite for Destruction, yeah, um, yeah. Iron Maiden, like all their albums mm-hmm. going all the way up to Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Um, so that's like seven Iron Maiden albums. Yeah. Ozzy Osbourne, like the first four, five mm-hmm. Ozzy albums. Um, I listen to a bunch of different stuff, but in, oh, Queensryche. Okay. So like the first four Queensryche records, uh, the EP, um, the uh, the EP Warning, Rage for Order, and Operation Mind mm-hmm. Crime. Like I'm, dude, I was like you know, listening to Operation Mindcrime uh-huh. on my headphones like three days ago, walking out of Barnes & Noble <laughs> like in the dead heat and fucking sing going, no, no, uh-huh. like out loud. Like I'm like, I still fucking love this shit. Like I am not, nah, this is never going away. Yeah. Like this fucking album rocks. Uh-huh. I fucking love Queensryche. I never still. got into Queensryche. They're, I mean, look, they're, in a way, if you listen to Jeff Tate's like operatic vocals, mm-hmm. it, it's not for everybody. Like people are like, oh my god, that sounds like the cheesy like metal thing yeah. that we all make fun of, like the spend because it's all like warning, warning, warning. Mm-hmm. Uh. <laughs> not everyone can get on board uh-huh. with that. Like into the eyes of a stranger. It's like not uh-huh. for every, It's not everybody's <laughs> cup of tea. But dude, there is a gravitas and a drama uh-huh. and a theatricality to that music that they perfectly encapsulated yeah. with with those albums that like no other band has been able to with such uh dexterity mm-hmm. do what they did and especially operation mind crime it's just a it's a masterpiece yeah. it's an absolute masterpiece how'd you get into the metal someone turn you on to it or yeah i mean you know queens you know, listening, hearing shit on the radio and mm-hmm. going, what is that? That sounds heavy and yeah. fucking brutal. Like, I kind of like that. And then, like, you befriend somebody who has, like, a tape. Okay. And they bring over, I'm like, can you bring over the tape? Mm-hmm. And they bring over the tape and it's, like, Quiet Riot and Twisted Sister uh-huh. and fucking Iron Maidens on there and Queensryche. And then, like, another guy is like, I'll make you a tape. And, like, oh, my God, there's Queensryche mm-hmm. on here. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it took hold yeah. that way. Was yeah. this an escape? Totally. Yeah. And that's also in the show. There's some like musicological discussion of how grunge decimated metal. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a part of that in the show Um, because, you know, I'm a very late Gen Xer. I'm Mm -hmm. 42 years old and um, I, you know, am really, really like on the cusp between Gen X and millennial. Okay. So, you know, because of when I was born, by the time I was getting into metal, it was already, metal was already mm-hmm. kind of like the fissures were, it was like 88, 89. Yeah. The fissures were actually starting, you know, Jane's Addiction's first album had mm-hmm. just come out and like there was stuff going on in Seattle that nobody really knew about. Yeah. And of course, when Nevermind happened, that's when it all kind of like yeah. broke, right? So that happened for me at a really weird time. So I was like still 20, 21 mm-hmm. when all that shit was going on. And it was, it broke through like a kind of fantasy structure yeah. that, 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 um, that was really, really important for me in terms mm-hmm. of me- like metal was all about fucking tits and dragons and blood mm-hmm. and fucking like social yeah. injustice. It was heightened. It was operatic. It was like on, it was on the Shakespeare level, but mm-hmm. like with cheese, just think ca- yeah, cheese yeah. casserole with, with <laughs> Shakespeare, you know, that's fucking metal. And that's what makes it fucking, you know, Iron Maiden writes songs about Alexander the Great and mm-hmm. like Rime of the Ancient Mariner and like with no irony. Yeah. Like no, like no sense of, and, and no subtext. Like no, it's like, no, that's what this song is about. Yeah. Like that's nothing else. Yeah. It's nothing else. It's just like, we're going to talk about his, history right uh-huh. now. And it's just like, really? You're going to do this? Yep, we're going to do yeah, yeah. It's not a metaphor <laughs> at all. And it's just like, wow. Like you're just going to fucking, and it's so ostentation. It's so over the top. It's, yeah. So, yeah, it was a total escape. And then grunge came, and mm-hmm. it was just like, now shit is real. Yeah. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> I was so disappointed when grunge came out. So how did this find, or did it find its way into Interpol? So, yeah, it, it's like, you know. Like, were you listening to Joy Division? Like, that's often the well, comparison. Yeah, no, of course. No, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I went to NYU and then I just started discovering goth clubs and, like, okay. you know, different kinds of music. And I was listening to The Cure and, like, you know, then that led me into bands, like, post-punk bands like okay. Joy Division and so forth. So, yeah, no, I was totally, it wasn't, I wasn't coming at Interpol with, like, a metal, uh-huh. a heavy metal palette. <laughs> I wasn't like, let's make this more like uh-huh. Megadeth. 
it was the spirit of metal that kind of made me like really want to take hold of that mm. lifestyle. Like the kind of like, fuck it, we're going to do this. Okay. Fuck it. We're just going to fucking do this. You know, mm-hmm. you kind of have to have a little bit of that yeah, yeah. in order to be like, you know, in a really successful band, you have to have the like, kind of like the cojones. Mm-hmm. I don't know how else to put it. Um, but in terms of like the actual musical influences, no, it was much more like post punk okay. and like the cure and alt rock and all of that okay. sort of stuff. That was sort of, that was really fueling okay. uh, at that time. Yeah. So, so how did you just kind of wrapping up, how did you come up with Carlo D Carlos D? Um, we were, uh, you know, discussing, we were like, all right, we got to write our names down for like, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, what they're going to put on the, on the, uh, record label, yeah. you know, on the, on the, like, uh, you know, personnel, like, the, mm-hmm. and, um, I was just like, I don't know. I don't, Carlos Dengler. It's just, um, it doesn't have a nice ring yeah, to it. Yeah. You know, it doesn't exactly <laughs> mellifluously fall out of the lips, you know? Um, so, you know, I was like, how, what am I, I'm not going to keep Dengler mm-hmm. <laughs> with all due respect to my German heritage. Uh-huh. Um, Dengler doesn't exactly <laughs> kind of come out the right way. It's kind of like Ferner. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I decided that you know, let me, you know, let me keep Carlos, and then just put the D there mm-hmm. because then it's just like it's still my name, but like then I don't have to pronounce Dengler. Okay. And did you have the character of Carlos D, the slick back hair, all black? Was that? Yeah, that was around the same time. That was essentially like a emerging of like goth and mod. Okay. Which was kind of like what was going on in mm-hmm. New York at, at that time. Okay. Got it. Cool. So when people, you at the French Festival, what do you think want your intention people to walk away from or your intention of the play? Um, I want people to just... Um, feel like they got a, a chance to um, you know ask themselves some questions that they probably don't always ask themselves mm-hmm. if I, I think if I could have you know accomplished that on, on just even like on a, on a you know it doesn't have to be like grand or anything you yeah. know? And, and, and I and I just want to like you know say that like I am you know, I don't have any like grand, like, Oh, I'm going to take over the world kind of mm-hmm. like, stuff about this. Like, I'm just starting out doing this. I'm, it's a great privilege to be at the, at the fringe festival this year. You yeah. Know? So, you know, I'm not saying like, it's gotta be this fucking, you know, crazy experience. I just, I want, I want to, I want to s- sit there and, and talk about, you know, a, a reality like growing up and, and needing heavy metal and mm-hmm. needing, needing things to make sense in a certain way that has to do with art. And I want people to ask themselves like what their relationship to art is, like how art, you know, what, what, how art may have made them choose certain things. Like if somebody walks out of watching Homo sapiens interrupt us with like thinking like, Oh wow. You know, I never thought that, you know, I interacted with art Mm -hmm. when I was 15 years old in that way. Like, yeah, that would be like a a huge success, yeah. I think. A ma- that would be a massive success. Yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, boys. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Carlos Dangler here on Talk Music Talk. Great conversation. Great guy. I enjoyed talking to him. I hope you enjoyed listening. Before we recorded, I was telling Carlos about the importance of Antics, the second album of Interpol. It came out during a rough patch of my life, a long rough patch. I was working on one of my novels at the time, Screwball Comedy, and for two hours every night after working two jobs, I would put on my headphones, put on antics, and write for two hours, and I would look forward to this time every single day. Just two hours of playing antics on loop, the same 10 songs over and over and over. And I never would have guessed that 11, 12 years later, I would be interviewing him on my podcast. In fact, I didn't even know what a podcast was. And look what happened. I admire his talent and his music and how he has overcome challenges in his life. I caught Homo Sapiens Interruptus, and I highly recommend it. If you missed it, 
you have another chance if you are in New York in October, late October, because it did so well. Great reviews, sold out shows. It is returning as a part of the Fringe Festival Fringe Encore series. That's right. Late October. Go to his website for more information. CarlosDengler.com. D-E-N-G-L-E-R. Also, my apologies to Alice Cooper. I believe the correct pronunciation of his name is Vincent Fernier. Not whatever Carlos and I were saying. Our hearts were in the right place, but our pronunciation was not. I have a website, talkmusictalk.com, for more information on this very podcast. Or you can follow me on Instagram at thisisboyce, B-O-I-C-E. And call to action, don't forget to download the Talk Music Talk app wherever you get your apps for iPhone and Android. Just leave a rating and or review in the store. And if you don't want to do the app, that's fine. You can still go to iTunes and download it or Google Play and subscribe. However you want to do it, I would appreciate it. And I got a back catalog suggestion for you. Episode number 41 with Josh Dion. He is one half of this wonderful Paris monster group, a New York band. You have to see Josh live. He sings and he plays drums with one hand and keyboards with the other. And yet it is not gimmicky in any way. They make some great music. He talks about how he got into music and drums and his fundamentalist background Another story of overcoming challenges and obstacles. So check that out. Episode number 41 with Josh Dion of Paris Monster. Thank you so much for listening to my 100th episode. Please return for 101. Thank you so much. Till next time. And there will be a next time. This one's for you, Liz. 